then charisma, and the, the younger one, Jaba, for their hospitality when I came to Germany, and for the fellowship that has been within us for many, many, many years. May God richly, richly bless you. Uh, I want to, I mean, send my greetings to my own father, my spiritual father, and my mentor, Apostle Dr. Godwin Tumi, and the wife, Martha, Mama Martha, and all the family. Uh, we also want to uh, signal our appreciation to the area heads in Germany, all officers, and all listeners this afternoon. We thank God for what he has done, and uh, I'm so humbled and honored to share the word of God with you, that together we will I mean, praise God for what he's doing. Right, I move on, and before everything, I want to assure you that God sends his word to heal them and deliver them from their destruction. Everything that God does, he uses his word. Because the word itself contains a mountain moving and a rock spreading power that paves way where there's no way, and that brings things to existence, things that does not exist. So I pray this day that we will open up unto him that the capability and the creativity that is in the word of God will move and be displayed in our lives that after this message, we will have a testimony. I know God is going to touch somebody. He's going to heal somebody. He's going to bring somebody out of distraction, and uh, he's also going to show his glory unto somebody. As I bring you a message entitled, I beseech thee, show me your glory. I beseech thee, show me your glory. We'll be moving into Exodus, but before then, I want to just bring you the, the background. We have a whole nation, Israel, who has been delivered from Egypt. And on their wilderness journey to a promised land, there came something. They disobeyed God by sinning against him. And going in for a, a God, a man-made God. So God described them to be a stiff naked people. And then the, he decided that the God who was leading them, guiding them, saving them, his presence will no more go with them. And when the nation heard about it, the, the sad news, they began to mourn. And then Moses, their leader, interceded for them. And Moses asked God something, that God, show me your ways. Moses was saying this because he knew when God shows his, way, his ways, situations will turn. He has had many experiences with God, that at the time he intercedes for his people, and God really, really intervened, situation changes. But along the line, who feel that there is more of God, more of God. When things happen in Egypt, the very things that happened in Egypt were of different level of, as compared to things of, I mean, paving waters. So every time he could see a new glory of God, and he had the desire to know more. So after he has prayed that God, show me your way. And God responded, I will show you your way. So some says, God shows the, his way to Moses, but his deeds to the people of Israel. Moses move on again, that there's more than him. So I will seek again and ask greater things. I pray that whatever you have asked him, he is a great God, such a big God. He has a lot to give us. May we never be sufficient, but rather tonight, may we desire to ask more. I want you to ask more and ask big things. Because we serve such a great and a big God. And so, in the Exodus 33, verse, I will pick it 18 to 23, but I will pick it from verse 17, there was something that Moses asked. And uh, I will take it as one of the greatest requests or petition that man has ever made. We are reading from Exodus chapter 33, Verse 17 to 23, Exodus chapter 
33, verse 17 to 23. From the New King James Version, I read. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. This is where he asks to, for God to show him his ways. And then he said, please, show me your glory. He was asking another thing. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cliff of the rock and uh, will cover you with my hands and cry I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Amen. So we could see over here that after Moses has experienced many manifold and multifaceted glory in the diverse ways about God. Some are uh, his 40 days commune with God. He only experienced God in another way. The circle behind the burning bush, a bush burning, the fire was burning without being consumed. Jehovah even speaking with him, to him, face to face, as a human being will speak to his friend. It's a wonderful experience. Seeing a river parting into two, it's a great experience. Even, even the wonders that took place in Egypt. All these things are a great experience. Uh, Moses have experienced God in the many, many other ways. But here, this petition seems to be one of the greatest petitions that a uh, human being had ever asked God. And uh, I believe it may be a greater supplication that a man could even make to God. I beseech thee, show me your glory. As Moses was saying, and as we move through, we get to know that now God has spoken to Moses face to face, but he couldn't see him. And now he wants to move to the next level. I want to see your face. And God said, my face, no one shall see and leave. God, after God has answered him the first one, he was asking all this. Why? Because Moses had had an experience with God that, that his glory, it meant the time that his glory descend. His glory bring distinction between them and the other nations. Look at what happened in Egypt. That in the land of Goshen, they were experiencing joy and celebrating. Why that very night, in the land of Egypt, they were mourning. So in the time that Moses was facing those period, and uh, God has promised, my presence is no longer with you. The, 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 the going has become so tough. The uncertainty is so high. The right thing go, Moses has to do, and we also, is to ask for his glory. In fact, we are in the period time a time that world leaders has even declared war in time of peace, a war against invisible enemy. And as human beings as we are, how can mortal person fight against immortal thing or invisible thing? This invisible enemy is ravaging lives, barring people from social gathering with a new world social distancing. Telling even the church, the wife of God, to be indoors. The environment is now controlling the affairs. In such a moment, we need the righteous people of God. All nation is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the men of God, the sons of God. 
It is a time and it's a right time for us to cry unto our God that, Oh Lord, show us your glory. What is this glory of God that Moses was asking about? And how does this glory of God relate to us and the church in our day? God is spirit. And anything of him, we can never me measure. Because no one can know him in totality, through searching. But as women as we are, we can understand glory from our own point of view. Humanly, perspectively, when we talk about glory, we are meaning highly renounced or honored won by a notable achievement. Somebody has done something that is so magnificent, so great in beauty, so perfect and splendor. And we normally call it so weight. We call it glory. This is all that we can say concerning a glory in the human perspective. And with all this, a human being is being glorified in certain things. It's being glorified for a particular notable achievement. Not all things. For example, if it's a footballer and he's very good in playing, he's being glorified that he's a footballer. When we get to another field, He's no more there. And also, that glory is so limited. It's not limited. So before you know, the, the star for the year is passed, and another replaces it. But our God, the glory we are talking about, first of all, God is infinite God. His glory, the glory of God is infinite. Actually, it has no beginning, and it has also no end. And it even requires eternity to be able to comprehend or grab the fullness of his glory. God, God alone knows the fullness of his glory. For his glory is intrinsic. It is part of his being. Belonging naturally. Naturally, he is glorious. Nothing can make him less or more glorious. Nothing can make him less glory because his glory is attained from himself. He rarely manifests at times because we are human. His glory towards us, his infinite, I mean, infinite glory towards us through many diverse ways. Some of the ways is that when you walk, you look at the creation of God. It's so beautiful. It is glorious. It tells us that God is glory. When you look at his providence, it is glorious. And then when you go through all scripture, you see the glory of God and strength everywhere in the scripture. Even in judgment, judgment is glorious in judgment. You watch his plan of salvation, how he has saved mankind. It's so glorious. And above all, when men, holy men, people who have believed in him, begin to live a life that is holy in this dark world of sin. It really shows the glory of God. But uh, moving on, the glory of God, since God is infinite spirit, then his glory is infinite and it is spiritual, his glory, his glory. But he at times tried to manifest his glory in a human form that we can see. And in the Old Testament, he will reveal himself most of the time, his glory as a glorious light in the thick cloud, a glorious light enshrined in the very thick cloud or a smoke. So within the smoke, you see a glorious fire within that smoke, showing his radiant presence the presence of, I mean, the radiance of his presence. And also, we normally call unapproachable light. Ah, that is his presence. And from the scripture, I'm want, I want to quote certain scriptures to prove my point before moving forward. When we get to Daniel 2.22, Daniel 2.22, Daniel 2.22 says that he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. So Daniel said, this our God, light dwells with him. And when we get to Psalm 104 verse 2, Psalm 104 verse 2, 
It says that the Lord wraps himself in light with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. So over here, the God wraps himself with light. So he uses a garment as light. His clothes that he wear is light. Hallelujah. Then Paul continues to I mean, the, uh, admonish his own son Timothy in Timothy in First Timothy six thirty sixteen. First Timothy six sixteen. That God alone is immortal, and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. So over here, God also not only is clothed, but now he lives in unapproachable light. He has he used cloth, uh, light as a cloth, but now he lives in unapproachable light. The thing gets on becoming so better and interesting. that when we get to uh, First John, First John 1 5, he says, this is the message I have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. God is light. So we began by seeing God using, I mean, uh, light. He's, uh, I mean, close with light. He using light to, I mean, he lives in the light. He has light as a cloth that he really put on. But over here, John said, simply, he landed that bomb shed. God is light. So when we come to the assembly, we can get to know that God is light and he dwells in unapproachable light, and no man can see him. It's like a sun. We know how sun is. He created even the sun. And we are talking about something greater and greater more than sun. But human beings, we cannot get something to just, I mean, compare. But even when you watch sun, the, great, the more you get closer to, the more you get closer to, the more difficult it becomes, the more harder it becomes. You burn before getting closer. That may be the reason why that Moses was asking something that will burn him in totality. And God said, you cannot see my face, but yet I'm a glorious God. I will do something. So you can see that even when you get to Revelation, the whole city, the new Jerusalem city, the, the, the hope of all hope that all righteous people are waiting for, that city does not need sun. Sun has been dismissed from that city. And the, the, the sun or the light in that city is just God's glory that is going to show shine in that city. You've got to be there. And I also need to be there. A city that we will, sun will not, no more smite us, but we will experience sun all right. And that sun is a marvelous one. Is the glory of God that will shine for his people. Amen. So Moses then want to see Moses and this glory he was talking about. Moses said, Lord God, I beseech you, show me thy glory. And we have already established that. Moses has already seen many glory of God. The burning bush, what he did to Pharaoh, the, the river that was paved into two, the pillar of fire that was leading them. It was so amazing. It was so amazing. But you could see that. He wants to see and hear and know more of God. At times, this should be our caliber. How far we have known God, we have to desire to know him more. Like somebody like Apostle Paul, after encountering God in so many ways, even the light of God keeping him blind. With all that he experienced with God, he continued to say that, oh, that I may know you. Ah, this should be our cry, that I may know you and the, the power of your resurrection, that I will have fellowship, and even I want to join, join, be part of your suffering and even your death. This should be our desire. The challenge we have in this time is that uh, we easily forget a glory that God has revealed in our lives. And so before, because we easily forget, we don't desire to get or see more than what we have ever experienced. You easily forget. So there's no desire for us to go in to seek more. But for, David, for Moses, 
he remembers all the glory he has experienced. And therefore he said, I want to see your glory. And as I said, from the answer from God, shows God who knows the mind of everybody. Before even you begin to think, or you begin to say something, he already knows the answer. Know very well from the inner part of Moses that Moses now wants to see him face to face. Because how can you communicate with somebody who are just communicating? He's hearing you like face to face, but he can't see your face. So there's a desire. The person who communicated to me, I, I was feeling something. Now I want to see him face to face without any veil. And God was so, is so gracious. I want us to see how he answered him that, uh, a very gracious way. And we will use it tonight for us to pray. When we continue, we can see that God answered this very prayer. And uh, with this, I'm telling you, tonight God is going to answer somebody's prayer. There is going to be a breakthrough. God is going to make a way where there's no way. When we get to the verse 19 of what we said, God answered him. It came in a three gracious way. It was all gracious. But when we don't understand God, we blame God. But he said gracious in everything. God answered Moses in the gracious, three gracious ways. And I want us to look into it. When we get to uh, the verse 19 of Exodus 33, he said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So over here, we can take one by one, we see something, a, a manifestation of his grace, a grace, a glorious manifestation. He's saying that, Moses, all that you have said, I will now cause my goodness to pass in front of you. So Moses might have known God in many ways, but his conception but how far he has known God can never be compared. And even he was asking, show me your glory. He never knew into the exact extent that thing may, might end it. Because you know God is glorious in everything. So he can be glorious in his justice by sending some calamity. And still he's glorious. This, God can also show Moses his glory by bringing his wrath. It's still glorious. When he brought the wrath upon the people of Egypt, it was so glorious for everybody to know that God is really glorious. Nobody can be compared to God. He can also make something to bring, he made his power and his mightiness be known. But over here, with the petition that Moses asked, God answered that petition, not in any, this, in any of this way, by coming with such a, a sweet, small, loving voice, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will cause all my goodness. As you are hearing me, may all the goodness of God be available unto you. May that goodness of God overtake you. That from now onward, any steps you make, you will be stepping into the goodness of God. Amen. I will make, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. The goodness of God is God's glory. One of his greatest glory is his goodness. The normal say God is good all the time. God is good. But when God is using the word, all my goodness, not my goodness, but all my goodness, there comes a different meaning. That Moses because of what you have asked, I'm going to show you all my goodness. So what I mean is that time will not be enough for you, Moses, let alone to see my glory, let alone even to consider and begin to count it one by one. I'm going to show you all my glory. So all my glory begins from eternity past to your time and to what I have to do. Moses, I'm going to show you all my glory. All my glory, all my glory. Who can really tell 
and never tell and count the goodness of God towards us. Even towards creation. Just watch and think a bit about the insects that walks around. They, were, they are all looking unto him to have their meal. The lilies of the valleys, they don't work. The birds that flies in the air, they are all looking unto him. The fish that can be found in the seas and the waters, the animals that crawl, crawls. Even the trees, when God doesn't fall rain, they begin to suffer. You can see thousands of thousands of creations who depend on the God of all flesh. And so summer, the summer says that the eyes of all these and they give you give them their food in due season. You open your eyes, you open your hands, and you satisfy the desire of every living creature. That is wonderful. Every living creature, we have our being, and we derive our names from him. So he is so glorious that he is able to support and feed and provide for all creations. But when we are talking about that, uh, and we are talking about God's glory, he said, all my glory, so it is the past and even the present. Consider even people who has dead and gone. They are many countless. But yet, the Almighty God knows all and remembers all. Consider his righteous people that calls on him every day. And the righteous people who are dead for many centuries. God knows all of them. He has planned for them. He considers all of them. So you can see that the goodness of God is unspeakable. Oh, the Bible said, God's mercies, by his mercies we are not consumed. Ah, and his compassion never fail. But they are new, they are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. May the mercies of God, may the compassion of God be renewed unto you every morning. That every morning you step into a new level, a new level of God's grace and glory. I will cause my goodness to pass before you. All oh, my goodness. But over here, there's a word of caution. The goodness of God and sovereignty of God. No one attribute can really set God out for the perfect person he is. So anytime you are talking about God's goodness, you have to know God is also sovereign. A sinner can easily say that I will go to heaven without, uh, with all the sin I've made because God is good and God is merciful. Yes, of truth, God is good and God is merciful. But yet God is just and God is sovereign. So if you can only see one part of God, be God good, without seeing that he's also sovereign, then you have sin and have God. He is both good and sovereign. Actually, by his sovereignty, he chose to create us for his pleasure. Let us get that thing right. He has his own desire. And one day he chose to create something we call a world. And create people he call a human being. So he created that as from his pleasure, his own delight. He can choose to create us anyhow, and we have no question. He is creating. He can even choose to create you like a dog, and you have nothing. He has his word, and he said he's creating. So how far he created you, how beautiful like his image, all shows his glory. And you cannot question him about that. He can choose to, I mean, own us. All these owners, all this, he does it for his own pleasure. And nobody can ask him a question. So you can see that putting together the goodness and the sovereignty of God, then you can really comprehend the glory of God. And then you can say, 
God is really glorious. I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. And I will have mercy. So he can have mercy. To those who choose, he will have mercy. And then we come, so the first one, we have seen that God answered this prayer through a glorious manifestation. I will cause all my goodness, it's so gracious, to manifest before you. But he continue again that you cannot see my face. And this, I will term it glorious concealment or cover up. Where is he has asked and God has answered part. And he said the other part, you cannot see my face. What is God trying to hide from him? He said, for no man shall see me and leave. I want us to know this, that when God doesn't tell us or reveal anything to us, there is such much grace in it, like of holding what we want to see, like the same revealing unto us. I want to repeat myself. God may choose to uphold something from us. By that doing, there's much grace in it. Like he revealing something unto us. For the Bible said, because he knows what is best for us. All oh, secret things, there are secret things. The secret things belongs to the Lord our God. But those things that he revealed belongs to us and our children forever. So God has things that he uphold from us. And he has things he revealed. So God want to uphold his presence, his very face from Moses. This might be that if he see him in his face, Moses will burn to ashes. So he does it. He's, so concealing something from uh, Moses is a grace. He was showing the grace of concealing something from him. If God is supposed to reveal secret things in the spirit to us, maybe we may not have courage to move just an inch. But to save us, he conceals certain things from us. Just can't we evaluate the power of God? If Moses have to see his face, even think about, even the angels that serves God, they are divine beings. Those who are close to his throne that are serving God, they need six wings, two to cover their, their, I mean, their feet, and two to cover their faces so that they cannot see the, those manifold glory of God directly, and two to fly. So even angels that have been prepared to be in the presence of God cannot see his presence, his face. How can a human being see his face and then leave? So there are many things God would not show up to us. At times, human beings, we are such so inquisitive. We want to know everything. And everything that comes, we have a result for it. But there are very things that will never be very helpful to you. So many things are happening, especially even this sickness. We have a lot of theories around. But God knew everything. Nothing takes him by surprise. If God has allowed these things to come, then he has an ulterior motive because even in his glory, when it comes to something that is deadly, something that is shameful, it turns the whole situation around to become something glorious. That's why his glory will come upon the earth that was chaotic, endless, formless. And before we know, the glory has transformed everything to something wonderful. I pray today that whatever situation you are passing through, even in this season, a perilous season, people have been affected. People are in sorrowful mood. People don't know what tomorrow lies. I want to assure you that whatever situation you have been, all that we need tonight is the glory of God that will come upon you. And that glory of God is a, a game changer that will turn situations around. May this happen to you in the name of the Almighty God. Amen. Then I want to touch the third one from the readings. You can see the first one was, it was manifesting a glo gl grace unto him by showing, allow his goodness 
to, I mean, go I mean, before him, overtake him. Then we come to the second one by showing still a grace, by concealing something from him. Because you know when Moses got to see his face personally, he will burn immediately. So it's a grace he was showing, though he was hiding something from him. Then the third one for the reading, you could say that he was showing a grace, I can call it a protective grace, a grace that protects, that puts him into a, I mean, shading him around. When you read, he said, Moses, you have asked, I have to protect you. So even you want to see my glory, I want you to know some part of my glory. I'm now coming. I remain on this rock, and I'll pass by. And even as I pass by, I will put you in the midst of the rock. I will hide you over there, a hiding. I mean, a grace of hiding you. May the Lord hide you in this time of calamity. As his grace passed by, as his glory, his glory passed by. I will hide you and I will cover you with my hand. And as I hide you and cover you, I will pass by so that no harm will touch you, but you want to see my glory. But actually, you cannot see my face. So you cannot see what I'm about to do. You can only see my back. And when we talk about back, I will come there. So over here, you could see that God, in his own wonderful way, went to place him in a rock. And that rock, the Bible says is that when they were on the way coming, God proved to him that there was a rock following them. And that rock, Moses really pointed and uh, smashed on the rock, and then gushed the water. And the Bible says that rock is Jesus. So I'm going to establish you on that rock. And as I pass by, that rock in the mo mo many mountains, I will put you in one of the claims. I will cover you. Because what you are about to see, you cannot withstand. So that after you have seen what you can contain, you will begin to know my glory. So you could see, I want to ask you, when God is showing his glory, he shows his glory to people who are in the rock. And the rock is Jesus. So this shows us that it is this time we need to be in him. Jude says something and so amazing. At times we shift all the responsibility to the divine, God. But we have human responsibility and uh, God's responsibility. Jude 21 says something that keep yourself in the love of God. So first, it is you keeping yourself in the love of God. Then when we get to 24, he said, now that you have kept, your, kept yourself in the love of God, uh, he is able to keep you from stumbling or falling. So first of all, you have to keep yourself in the love of God. I challenge you today to keep yourself in him. For so when you are in, in, in him, then you have given to him and he's able to keep whatever you have given unto him. Now we see hell and death parading, chasing humanity every day. The safe place is to be in the cave. The safe place is to be on the rock, hided in the cliff. I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. I will cause. And you will not even see my face. You will see my back. And over here back, when God is saying this, it is a, a metaphor, a figurative language, a human language that is expressed to explain spiritual reality because we are such finite. God is not a God like as we see ourselves, but he made that symbolically like him. That when he, explains, he says that, this is my hand, at least we can understand him what the hand can do. And we know we understand God by that way because we cannot comprehend him in totality. So when you say you cannot see my back, it's not that God is moving and you can see his back. God is full in all things. But I want to tell him so that Moses will understand that my back is my history. So I'm passing by. You cannot see my face. You cannot see what I'm about to do. If you can know all this, then God seems to be God. 
You can only know my, my past glory. My past, the glory I've shown before, which you were not there. I can show you. Immediately God passed. Then Moses saw the glory of God, the, 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 the past glory of God, the back of God, the past glory of God. And then he began to know, ah, no man has ever been there. Where was Moses when God was creating things? By midnight, Moses can now see the past glory of God and say, yes, in the beginning, in the beginning, God began to create. In the beginning, this thing happened. In the beginning, there was formless. The land was formless. And he said, let there be light. All this thing happened. Moses was not born. It was a past glory of God. But as Moses allowed himself, and he got to know the past glory, he was able to relate to human beings for us to get that understanding. Well, how things began. How times began. We have many people in the Bible who allowed themselves for God to tell them some of his past glory. You could see somebody like uh, uh, Isaiah. He would be a Ezekiel and others who even tell us uh, that they saw what happened. Really, uh, uh, Satan flashing down like, uh, where were they? It, uh, it has already taken place. But because they allowed themselves, God was able to reveal certain things that human speaking, no man person could ever know. We are, this is also our generation. And nation is true. They are all looking for the revelation. They are looking onto the revelation of the sons of God. This is a time that we have to come to us to ourselves and cry out to God that show us your glory. Let us know some of your ways and some how you do things so that we can with clarity explain to people who are really in need. So you can see the glory of God. God is so merciful. As I try to end somewhere and we pray, God is so merciful that in the beginning, when he began to show his glory, Sam was on the Mount, uh, Sina, Mount of Sinai, Mount Sinai. And when God was showing his glory, it was full of smoke, fire. And when God descended in that smoke below, it was like a furnace. And the whole mountain was trembling violently. No animal was to get near. And the, the fire was burning with darkness and gloom and storm. And it was accompanied by a trumpet blast. And the, the, the presence became so terrifying that even Moses said, I'm too much trembling with fear. This is one part of his glory. And people could not get nearer. So the merciful God always begin to find a way that we can comprehend and embrace his glory. So at the same time, we get to a time that his glory will come to the tent of meeting. A lot of people will see that glory from afar without trembling. To a level that when Solomon was dedicating his temple, we saw the glory of God come into the temple, manifesting God's holiness, indicating that human being has to worship God. And when we do things that is acceptable, he shows his glory upon you. But as we progress into the New Testament, he makes the thing more fine and fine and so beautiful that after many years of that period, after about 500 years, before we know, there was this shepherd keeping their flocks at night. Immediately the Bible said, an angel appeared, and it was said, the glory of God shone around. And as it continued, this glory that we are talking about, that glory became flesh and dwelt among us. And we also saw this, his glory. And we can identify that it's the glory of the Son of God. And, and he will let us know that he is the uh, express representation of God himself, the radiant of God's glory, which is Jesus Christ. And that glory now, Bible said, that very glory came to us and uh, verse 14 says he dwells in us. What a wonderful thing. So you could see that. The, first of all, 
this glory was really enshrined in the very deep smoke as fire and was very fearful, unapproachable. Then it came to a time that it came nearer to their tent of meetings that people can get closer. And to a time that he now filled the temple where people are to accept their offering. And finally, this glory has now come among us and has now dwelt among us. So now there is this eternal seed of glory planted on you, a seed of glory, which is eternal, planted on in you, that one day, that glory that is in you is going to buff off at that time of resurrection. But now that the glory has been planted in you, that's why it is said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is a hope. So the glory is in you. And the Bible continues to say that God is able to do abundantly, exceedingly greater things through his power that resides in us. So that glory will be given to God. So you can see now that that glory what, that was so far, a seed of that glory, of that eternal glory, has been planted in us. So something of heavenly is now part of us. We now have a divine nature. So we can easily connect and we can easily say, let, let thy kingdom come and that thy will be done on earth. So we all, with an unveiling faces, complete the Lord's glory and are being transformed, being transformed into his image with a increasing glory each day because of that implanted seed, eternal seed of glory that founds in us. So as I end my message, I want us, and I want to use that time for us to pray. I want to say about some benefits that brings the glory and we are going to pray. I won't waste time on it. There are, I am bringing about four things and we are going to pray upon that. You can see that the glory of God, when it comes, it transforms situations and make it glorious. I've already said, we see how the world was created. Woman, glory of God came upon it. It becomes something, something more glorious. Therefore, we are going to pray. And that's if you hear me. The word of God is performing miracles right now. That as we are praying, we are asking, we'll be asking the glory of God that let thy glory come and transform any chaotic, any bad thing, anything that is unglorious, anything that she is shame, anything that causes people to pity you. As the glory of God comes upon you, it really transforms everything to make it glorious. The last, which is the second one, and we want to praise that the glory of God brings distinction. When the glory of God comes upon you, it is not by might, but it distincts you. It makes you different. It makes you somebody different from others. It is him who does that. And you could know, why should the whole nation Egypt, the same land, some are experiencing light, another darkness, death, and others life. So even those who God's glory shined upon them, the way they live, the way they talk differs. When all people are saying casting down, they are saying lifting up because they have experienced something. May you experience God's glory in that way that you will you become very different. There will be a distinction between you and the normal way for all people to see that the glory of God lies upon you. The third one is that the glory of God, when it comes upon you, he fights your battle for you. And we are praying that all battle. He will pray, he will fight for us. I can't remember this story that Egypt was chasing Israel. They have entered into the sea. The miracle has happened, and they were chasing them. They were having chariots. They can run very fast. But the Bible said, when they were moving on, traveling, moving on, it, there's what we call a pillar, a pillar. And that is the glory of God leading them. It will change position. May God change position for you. That the very thing that are chasing you, may God change hands. That the very thing that are chasing you, now you begin to change them. And the Bible said, he withdrew from behind. And then this pillar moved to the front of them. And there was such a separation. You see, such a separation. And even the Egyptians began to struggle. And they testified that 
God has come fighting for them. May God begin to fight your battle for you. That people around will attest to the fact, they will consider, and they will finally say, it is God who is fighting for them. Let us walk out and move around. And then finally, oh, what an amazing thing. The glory of God will bring divine direction. Israel walked through the desert, and they never lost their way. So this is all we want to pray that in this time, may the glory of God come upon us. We want to be on our feet, and as we pray, I want you to gaze on his glory as he brings such a transformation unto you. I want you to lift up your voice. Even as we sing this song. The glory of God. The fire of God. Oh, the anointing of God. Is all I need. Oh, the fire of God. The fire of God. The Lord of God is yes, all I need. The glory of God, the Lord of God, the Lord of God is all I need. The presence of God. Oh, oh, is all I want us to pray that the glory of God will transform every situation that we are in. In our lives, to make it more glorious. May you lift up your voice unto Him. Yesterday <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> 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 <laughs>